welcome to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka from our studios here in London. Over the next half an hour, we'll be looking beyond the business headlines by giving you in-depth perspective on the stories that are affecting all of us. Coming up on today's show, exploitation, corruption and the blatant abuse of human rights. Not your typical assessment of the world's largest sporting spectacle, but the 2022 Qatar World Cup is anything but ordinary. Later in the show, I'll be joined by a former World Cup migrant worker, Jeffrey Otieno. He'll be joining me from Nairobi in Kenya to share his opinion on the controversies. And the World Health Organization recommends that every nation should have one doctor to 600 people. Nigeria has just one for every 8,300 people. A shocking figure that reveals that industry is in crisis. Well, hope is on the horizon, however, according to Skipper IQ Super Speciality Eye Hospital, based in the Federal Capital Territory. I'll be bringing you that report shortly. Then later, I'll be looking back at some of the biggest business news stories of the week. But first, let's start the show with a story that continues to make headlines here in the UK and across the world. The Scottish government cannot hold an independence referendum without the UK government's consent. The Supreme Court in England has ruled. The Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, wants to hold a referendum in October next year. But the court ruled unanimously that she does not have the power to do so because the issue is reserved to Westminster. The UK government has refused to grant formal consent for a referendum. This is the latest twist in an ongoing battle. That the United Kingdom is not a voluntary partnership of nations. Any partnership in any walk of life that requires one party to seek the consent of another to choose its own future is not voluntary, it is not a partnership at all. And while today's ruling may create temporary relief on the part of unionist politicians and parties, they should know the hardest questions that have been posed today are questions for them, because they are questions about the future and the basis of the United Kingdom. Now, the Westminster establishment may think it can block a referendum, but let me be clear, I am sure on your behalf today, no establishment Westminster or otherwise will ever silence the voice of the Scottish people. Earlier, I was joined by our business correspondent, Simon Pusey, for more on this story. Simon, every couple of months, we always hear uh, sentiment or rousings about uh, potentially there being a second Scottish independence referendum. This week, the Supreme Court based in England has ruled that out. Um, Nicola Sturgeon, the Scottish First Minister, cannot um, hold one without permission from the Prime Minister, which happens to be Rishi Sunak. For those who don't understand what this means, what does it actually mean? Yeah, well, two sides to this, really. One side is the sort of English and the unionist um, sort of perspective that says, hey, you've had your referendum, you've had your chance, you voted against um, Scotland being independent a couple of years ago, and you can't just keep having this vote mm -hmm. until you get the result that you you wanted. Then the other side is the Scottish independence side will said, well, hey, everything's changed now. You know, we've left the EU. That's against um, Scotland's wishes. Scottish voted to stay in the EU. And yet, because they're part of the UK, they've been brought out of it. So we should have a referendum now. It would be a different result, which is probably the case. Um, the fact that this Supreme Court ruling, uh, unanimous amongst the judges, um, means that, yeah, they need to go to Westminster and get permission. And they're not going to get permission to do that because of Westminster's stance. So what they're saying now in Scotland is that um, Nicola Sturgeon will use any um, upcoming general election and she will say that this is a de facto referendum yeah. so um, it remains to be seen how sort of you know watertight that can be and whether that can actually put into law but that's what they are saying separately there's also quite a lot of news coming out recently um, about Christmas and about the um, train strikes this will have a huge impact on businesses especially hospitality businesses that um, often depend really really heavily on those days around Christmas um, for their takings pubs and, and hotels and bars um, and this is going to be four separate strikes, 48 hours of strikes, um, which will really cause havoc, I think, uh, when people are wanting to go shopping, wanting to go out. Um, and so that's just sort of quite a bleak thing coming up to Christmas. But we're going to see a lot more of these strikes, I'm afraid, 
because of the cost of living squeeze and uh, higher inflation, um, you know, people are going to have to be paid more. And so people are going to be taking, I think, taking time off or striking if they are not going to be paid as much, especially um, in, in the public sector. Absolutely. It's getting colder and it's getting slightly bleaker, isn't it, Simon? Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's change gears now. Human rights campaigners have described the decision to hold the 2022 World Cup in Qatar as a disgrace, accusing the hosts of luring millions of people from the poorest countries on earth, many under false pretenses, and forcing them into what many are calling modern slavery. Since winning the bid in December 2010, more than 6,500 migrant workers have died in Qatar. Campaigners are now calling for the authorities to offer compensation for bereaved families and to those whose powerful testimonies are only now beginning to surface. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by Jeffrey Otieno, a former migrant worker who has since become an investigator at Equidem Research and Consulting. Equidem is a leading human rights and labour rights expertise for businesses, government and the not-for-profit sector. Geoffrey joins me from Nairobi, Kenya. Geoffrey Otieno, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global today. Uh, you've worked, well, you previously worked in Qatar for four years as a security guard overseeing safety at, I believe, two World Cup venues. I know your story is pretty much out there, but for our viewers in Nigeria and across the world that don't know about your story, can you tell us a little bit about it and why it has led to you becoming an advocate uh, for the migrant workers who, sadly, many of whom lost their lives? Thank you so much for hosting me. Uh, first of all, I have not worked in Qatar as a security guard. Actually, I worked as a, as a helper, technician helper, then later worked as a safety officer. During my work, I met a lot of challenges personally, and of course, challenges which affected majority of workers, especially of Asian and African origin, working in Qatar. I worked in Qatar since 2018. I just came back this year in June 2022. During the course of my work, I got involved with work which is directly related with hosting or preparing for the World Cup. I previously worked in Al Janoub Stadium. I actually worked in Lucille Stadium, of course, as a safety inspector. During the course of my work, I saw a lot of issues, especially on worker safety. Generally, personally, I've not in, in, witnessed a person who has died due to the work, but I've witnessed a lot of injuries, a lot of incidents, which have led to minor and major injuries. So you said you were there working for four years. You just got back to Kenya in June. How did you go from being a migrant worker to now being an investigator um, with Equidan? Actually... I started as a volunteer because previously in Kenya, I have been involved in unions. I have been involved in advocacy. So it was very easy for me to identify violations. Immediately I saw them. So when I went there, I became like a pro bono advisor to workers on what they are supposed to do in case they get in trouble with the employer. and. That grew from day one, and people started co contacting me. I became popular with giving advice on the procedures, legal procedures of, of, of filing labor disputes, and how to conduct yourself, especially when you are in trouble with your employer, especially during disciplinary hearings. That way, Equidem found me, especially during COVID, because we were doing a research on how to help guys who are affected with COVID psychologically and, of course, materially, because I was involved in volunteer provision of food from various organizations, and that's where I met Equidem. Right, OK. Um, so we know that, again, you know, the football started. There have already been some shock um, results, um, lots of controversy about popular pundits in the UK attending Qatar while virtual signaling, as we call it here. Um, there have been so many 
conversations around allegations of corruption, um, abuse of human rights, exploitation. Um, it has led many experts within the sector to suggest that there, could, there should be compensation for migrant workers or for the families of, I believe it's nearly 7,000 workers, which is a shocking figure, um, who died uh, in the run-up to the tournament. What, what would you like to see happen now? And what do you think the legacy of uh, this uh, World Cup will be? Actually, a lot of things have happened, but now we have to look at the greater picture. What is the need for workers, especially workers who are maimed, workers who are injured to the world, during the construction of these stadiums, and workers who even lost their lives during construction of these stadiums. I know there, are, there is a lot of noise because of the figures of workers who died. There are several conflicting reports, but the greatest thing FIFA and Qatar could do is create a fund run by workers and for workers to try and track down these workers and compensate workers who are owed money either through misrepresentation of contracts, wage theft, underpayment, non-payment of overtime, and all these violations. This will go to will, will go a great deal in lessening the pain the migrant workers feel, especially when they watch the tournament going on smoothly. Yes, I absolutely agree with you, uh, Jeffrey, and I think, you know, millions of our viewers uh, do too. Six and a half thousand uh, migrant workers dead and, of course, countless others injured. It's just not great, is it? I think it is likely to be a taint uh, on uh, the World Cup, but it's uh, important that your story is heard. So thank you so much for sharing it with us. Jeffrey Otieno, a former migrant worker um, in Qatar, now an investigator uh, with Equidan. Thank you so much for your time today. Before we head to the break, let's focus our attention on some cryptocurrency news, namely the collapse of the Bahamas-based exchange FTX. One million creditors around the world have been left with funds locked on the exchange or lost in the revolving doors of fund transfers between the now debunked company and its trading arm Alameda Research. For more on this story, I'm now being joined by Simon Dixon, the CEO and founder of BankToTheFuture.com. Simon joins me now from the Isle of Man. Simon Dixon, it's always a pleasure feasting upon your crypto knowledge. I did try to do a little bit of background reading myself, and I did read a headline in the Financial Times. It says, FTX's collapse underscores the need for regulating crypto. Do you agree? Uh, not regulating Bitcoin. So um, when people create their own cryptocurrencies, i.e. centralized people, it's more like a security. Um, so that's like a, you know, an equity and it certainly needs regulations. And when companies allow you to exchange, trade, buy um, and even borrow Bitcoins, those certainly um, should be regulated. In fact, already are regulated. They just ignored the regulations. Uh, but Bitcoin itself is much like a currency. Um, it's decentralized and there is, in fact, no way of regulating it. And people get confused with all the different things especially in these times of disaster. Well, absolutely. But I suppose because, you know, the, the FTX collapse is so huge. Everyone's talking about crypto. You can't discuss crypto without discussing Bitcoin. But I do want to ask about FTX because clearly, you know, the CEO, co-founder, founder, he's gone from being a multi-billionaire to bankruptcy. Not great. Nobody wants that. What do you think it was about their structure and business model that led to this embarrassment? <laughs> Yeah, well, this is what happens when you don't use Bitcoin as it was designed. Mm. So rather than you owning it, spending it and it having benefiting from its fixed supply, when you give it to somebody else, it's much like a bank. And FTX is essentially a bank that ignored all the regulations. And when you give it to people, they rehypothecate it, they create new versions, they commit fraud and they don't have lender of last resort and they don't have deposit insurance. Um, and so really with FTX, um, we've had a fraudulent bad actor where a bunch of people and institutions have let, allowed them to um, hold their Bitcoin. And uh, FTX and Sam Bankman-Fried has uh, dipped their hands in the cookie jar, committed fraud um, and siphoned off a lot of people's money by um, having a hedge fund. 
um, that printed its own token. Um, they leveraged the token and they destroyed everybody's money that um, trusted that company uh, to hold their Bitcoin. So um, again, we, we experienced this in the banking system in the 1920s and we implemented lots of regulations in the 1930s and our companies, um, rather than following those regulations, just ignored them and now everyone wants to blame Bitcoin itself. Simon Dixon, CEO and co-founder of BankToTheFuture.com. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Simon. In a moment, I'll be sharing a detailed overview from the recently held Africa Dubai Investment Summit. But until then, here's a breakdown of the biggest business news stories of the week. Manchester United's billionaire owners have confirmed that they are considering selling the Premier League football club. The somewhat controversial Glazer family purchased the team in 2005 for 1.3 billion US dollars. The revelation follows the departure of Portuguese striker Cristiano Ronaldo, who left the club on Tuesday night with immediate effect. During a controversial interview with Piers Morgan, which aired last week, Ronaldo criticized the side and said the Glazer family don't care about the team. For the first time since February 2021, France's private sector economy has contracted. According to November's S&P Global's Flash Purchasing Managers Index, the French service sector fell to 49.4 from 51.7. Any reading below 50 marks a contraction of activity. According to economists, falling client demand was a key factor underpinning lower output. The outgoing British national lottery operator Camelot has revealed its highest half-year sales ever at £4.1 billion. During a jackpot draw of £184 million in May, more than 15,000 players a minute signed into the national lottery app for a chance to win the eye-watering sum. Despite in-store tickets falling 4.7% for the six months to the end of September, during the same period, there was a 13% jump in online sales, with mobile phone play up 19%. Now to our next topic. Last week, the Africa Dubai Investment Summit took place in the UAE over two days, bringing together industrialists from across the world who have a keen interest in building strategic, economic and geopolitical partnerships in both regions. This year's theme was the future of global investment towards the next 50 years. Channels Business Global was given exclusive access by the event's conveners, Leaders Without Borders. This global initiative was created to encourage a strong strategic, economic and geopolitical partnership by promoting trade and investment across nations. There's so much happening in the energy space, especially uh, around Africa and particularly Nigeria. And we're here to make a case for international investment into the country and into the continent. Um, there's so much potential, and I think Nigeria has taken the right step in um, passing the PIA, and the NNPC has taken a giant step in making sure that they're um, aligning themselves and uh, positioning themselves to supply a lot of the energy needs, not just in Nigeria, but you know, to African Europe because of what's happening now with Russia and Ukraine. But on the other hand, you're hearing conversations about, you know, um, reducing investment in fossil fuels and so on and so forth. And this this is not in anybody's interest. And so we're here to make the case for um, for increased uh, investment in the oil and gas industry, particularly in Nigeria, because we've taken the right steps to make sure that things are done and that investments are guaranteed. Low tax, business deals and an extremely stable financial sector. As a representative of Africa and also being a woman in business, uh, it's important for me to be here to support everyone here that is in business and also sell myself as well and support every other person that is in business and I think also putting Africa at the forefront of what we do. I think we're extremely clever people. I think we're super intelligent and I think we have the expertise uh, to do better and I think it's important that we're all coming together as Nigerians in particular to support each other more. One of the things I've noticed is that the locals here have probably made the past things to get anything done because the way that the shakes take care of people. I attended last year's Leaders Without Borders Summit and I was in awe of the passion, the energy for senior people wanting to reach out and do business. So um, I was sold and I've come back this year and they very kindly asked me to be keynote speaker. And um, yeah, I want to help developing countries in Africa um, and developed countries in Africa to 
establish and enhance their existing airline services. So Africa is very poorly serviced in general with um, scheduled services and we can help airlines with subsidized aircraft that not that long ago were costing 350 million each and we can we can do them for sort of 65 70 million a piece so depreciation is taken care of and you're never going to make your money on a 350 million dollar aircraft because it's just a huge amount to pay back whereas with our aircraft you can make a return and the aircraft holds its value as well so you've still got an asset so that's the smart money and we're capitalizing on should we say um airlines that overcommitted themselves financially to very large of heavily financed fleets which is just non-sustainable so covid um, forced a lot of their aircraft to go into retirement um, and we are using those aircraft repurposing them to reinvigorate developing countries wow. so yeah and it creates jobs and it generates income you know and it, it provides direct flights to almost anywhere in the world so you're not going via a hub losing revenue to another airport you're gaining those taxes yourselves as a country so sponsored by uk-based hive energy and a one billion dollar greenfield project by us-based vantage data centers to build its first african campus now to our final topic, with just 24,000 doctors for a population of over 200 million, Nigeria is in desperate need of recruiting and retaining medical practitioners. The World Health Organization recommends that every nation should have one doctor to 600 people. Nigeria has just one for every 8,300 people, a figure that reveals the industry is in a crisis. Aside from a shortage of professionals, other stumbling blocks to the sector include issues with infrastructure, medical equipment, and medicine. Ensuring that potential patients can trust undergoing serious procedures in the country is also paramount and it is this reliability, professionalism and dedication that has led to the success of Skipper IQ Super Speciality Eye Hospital, which is based in the Federal Capital Territory. During a fleeting visit to Nigeria, the staff members opened their doors to Channels Business Global. The difference between the, the best uh... Nigerian doctor out of Nigeria and the best Nigerian doctor inside Nigeria, the difference is the exposure. Exposure to the right equipments, exposure to the right kind of trainings, exposure to the right kind of uh, management. If you add these three things together, uh, the same Nigerian doctors in John Hopkins also are doing excellent. The, 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 the number one heart surgeon of John Hopkins is in Nigeria. So that way, well, we, we have in, in, in Skipper IQ, we have uh, all foreign doctors also coming. We get uh, retina surgeons, cornea surgeons, uh, uh, cataract surgeons, uh, specialists for screen, various kind of surgeries. But you'll be surprised to see that our first medical uh, director, Dr. Tijani uh, Timitope, she was trained in Skipper IQ in India, and today she is one of the finest cataract surgeons. So if you see that way, Nigerians have a lot of uh, capacity and capability to, uh, to learn and adopt. So that way, you see all around, all Nigerian uh, optometrists, doctors, they are moving around. They are excellent. They are, the only thing uh, is required is the surroundings, the management and the machines. We believe in the best of machines. So most of the machines here are German or Swiss machines or Japanese machines. And the performance of these, uh, the people is also very good. Our uh, first eye hospital in Lego, Sanusi Fafua, was uh, inaugurated by Alaji Aliko Dangote. I saw his family coming over there for the treatment. So they trust. Even the Multi, multiple number of entrepreneurs who, are, who can afford to go and they started coming. So it all depends upon what kind of facility you have, what kind of machines you have, what kind of management you have. So I am sure in the days to come the things are going to change. The way I saw in India, in 2000 nobody believed in the Indian facilities and now in 2022 everybody wants to do medical treatment in India only because it is the cheapest and the best. Nigeria, I can foresee, that, give it five to seven years, let the government let, give a little more encouragement on the subsidies, capital subsidies or uh, 
uh, or the tax holidays, these kind of things. And I'm sure the medical tourism in Nigeria is going to transform totally. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today. But as always, do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channel's Business Global. Goodbye.